This is Jeffrey Gurian for GNN, Eugene, Oregon. Korea criminal Horace Pentathene literally carved himself a place in the annals of crime today by being the only man to ever rob a bank with his chin. Horace Pentathene did not always look like this. There was a time that Horace was a normal looking little boy until that fateful day when his parents took him to that Thanksgiving Day parade and he accidentally got sucked into the bell of a very large trombone. They rushed poor Horace to the hospital, where a nice doctor from another land removed Horace from the trombone and tried his best to repair Horace's damaged chin, which unfortunately was left as sharp and pointy as a knife. The doctor tried convincing Horace that it was a good look for him, saying, Don't worry, Horace, you look really sharp. But that was the start of Horace's deep inferiority complex. The children in school tormented Horace, throwing apples and sandwiches that stuck on his chin. They also used him as a barbecue skewer and to slice up their pizza. They even invited him to the school picnic just to use his chin to eat corn on the cob. The school custodial staff did their part in making Horace feel good about himself by using him as a cleaning tool in the schoolyard. Horace's mother did her best to make him feel useful using his head as a kitchen utensil. Oh, Horace, you're such a helpful son. I'm sorry the onions are making you cry. And so did his father, who tended to use Horace's face as a multi-purpose tool, kind of like a Swiss Army knife. Horace's chin also came in handy for whittling and for difficult electrical repairs. Thanks, son. You know, I couldn't have done this without you. In high school, Horace tried his best to act like the other kids, and actually almost attended the prom, until he accidentally ripped his date's dress and her jugular vein, after trying his best to snuggle up to her for the photos. Horace had been a promising violinist, but had to give that up too, when he destroyed one violin after the next. Horace's inferiority complex got worse and worse, and he developed a temper to match. That's when his physical appearance began to change. He began his descent into crime and insanity, and you could tell something was very wrong just by looking at him. He became a bad drinker, and was arrested more than once for pulling his chin on a guy during a bar fight. Anytime he heard a remark having anything at all to do with a knife, he went absolutely berserk. The last time it happened, all the guy said to Horace was, Hey, yeah, you're not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And that's all it took to set him off. It was after that most recent arrest that Horace was forced to carry his chin in a sheath. He tried growing a beard to camouflage his chin, but it wasn't that effective. Not able to find a job and becoming more and more antisocial, Horace was driven to a life of crime. In his desperation, he decided to rob a bank, hoping he could use the money to reshape his chin. Once in the bank, he got the teller's attention by pounding his chin on her window into a stack of deposit slips, piercing them easily like one of those sharp spindles they use to pierce checks in a restaurant. He passed her a note saying, I've got a chin. Fill this bag with money or I'll use it. Fortunately, the teller had the presence of mind to press the silent alarm, and within minutes, Pentathene was surrounded by shotgun-wielding police. Realizing his chin was no match for their shotguns, he put it back in its sheath and meekly surrendered. After first claiming to have had a carry permit for his chin, which later turned out not to be the case. Sorry, bud. This chin license is expired. Pending his trial... Pentathene has been remanded to the county jail where they were threatening to have his chin removed if he didn't behave himself. The warden said, Well, uh, we don't allow prisoners to carry weapons in here, and uh, this guy's chin certainly falls into that category. He's here two hours and already tried throwing his chin at one of the guards. And so the moral of the story is, Never take your child to a Thanksgiving Day parade and let him fall into the bell of a trombone unless you want him to turn out exactly like Horace Pentathene, one of the most unusual criminals in history. More on that story as it develops. 
In the meantime, today in New York City, Luigi Capo de Infante, an aspiring hedge fund manager, is suing a major Wall Street firm for what he claims is discrimination. Capo de Infante claims they won't hire him because he suffers from infantilism, a rare affliction that has left him with the head of a six-month-old infant. This is his story. Luigi Capo de Infante, 36 years old, stands six foot one, but suffers with a rare form of infantilism, which has left him with the head of a six-month-old infant, complete with wispy hair and baby teeth. Since he was a little boy, it had always been Luigi's dream to someday work in finance. When he was notified of the interview with this well-known financial institution, he got all excited and went all out to prim for the interview, including buying new cologne and trying his best to arrange each hair in the same direction. He thought his dreams were finally coming true. But all his hopes were quickly dashed as he was informed that he did not get the position. He claims he wasn't hired because he has the head of a six-month-old infant, but the brokerage firm claims otherwise. They say he misrepresented his financial experience. They need someone to run a multi-billion dollar hedge fund, and his experience was running the cash register in a bakery. Denfante says his interviewer <laughs> kept giggling during the interview and tried to take pictures of his head. A spokesperson for the firm says, If the interviewer laughed, it was only because Dan Fante has such a good sense of humor. And we routinely take photos of all our prospective employees for security reasons. Dan Fante says he was treated rudely, but they say, We were so nice to him, we even helped him untie his hat. Which was basically a typical infant's bonnet tied under his chin. Not exactly the right look for such a prestigious firm. The spokesman for the firm added, We are very open to hiring people with disabilities. To my knowledge, we have no one else with an infant's head, but we do have a man who limps. Capo de Infante claims it's merely a coincidence that his last name translates to mean head of an infant in Italian. He says he had no idea until recently that that was the case, and that he was just as surprised as everyone else. D'Infante travels in a custom-made vehicle designed especially for him and has been using that to get back and forth to court where this story continues to unfold. More on this history-making story as it develops. And now a story of historical significance. Washington, D.C. It's long been rumored that George Washington, the father of our country, wore wooden teeth. But that has recently been proven to be false. Not his teeth, just the rumor. What he did wear, though, was wooden pants, which are now on exhibit in the Smithsonian Institute. When Washington was born in 1732, his family was so poor that his father made his diapers out of bark. Stay still, George. This will only take a moment. As a young boy, he had to stand on a chair and jump into his pants, which gave him a very stiff walk and made him the brunt of jokes from his classmates, who often chased him with tools and threatened to saw off his pants. One day, George was late and was running to school when his legs accidentally rubbed together, causing a spark that almost burned down the schoolhouse. He and his family lived with that shame for many years. We lived with that shame for oh so many years. Some say it was that humiliation that spurred George years later to run for the presidency. And you know that famous story about George Washington chopping down the cherry tree? It was to get softer wood for his pants. Everyone knows that cherry wood is a lot softer than mahogany, which is what he had been wearing. Some say Washington was a heavy drinker because he could drink as much as he liked and never fall down. The wooden pants kept him up, which is where the expression came from, he drinks like he's wearing wooden pants. And that famous painting of Washington crossing the Delaware? Now you know why he was standing up in the boat. As dangerous as that is, it's almost impossible to sit down in wooden pants. It's also almost impossible to drown since his pants were so buoyant and could actually keep him afloat. One stormy night, his boat capsized but his men were able to hold on to his pants until they were saved. 
Since this discovery, Washington's wooden pants now reside in the Smithsonian Institute, under a plaque labeled with the nickname given to him by his men, Old Wooden Pants. That's the news. At times during this broadcast, I've been Jeffrey Gurian, and at some point in the future, probably will be again.